and welcome back to The Independent Pianist. I'm your host, Cole Anderson. Uh, today we are continuing a three-part series on the Tempest Sonata. I uploaded the third movement last week. You can check that out. I have a dis uh, link to it in the description box. Uh, I was originally planning on uploading the second movement today, but in listening through my recording that I made a few days ago, I discovered that it really was no good. It's really funny how that happens. You know, during the recording, I thought I really had something and it was going great. But then a couple days later, when I listened back, I found that it was way too slow and dragged out. I couldn't understand what I was doing, really. Also, my rhythmical pulse just wasn't strong enough to bind everything together, so I really have to do that again. So this just goes to remind me, if I needed reminding, of how, in certain ways, slow movements are really much harder than fast movements. So finding the right balance between freedom and rhythmic continuity is extremely hard so that the piece will really carry through and keep the listener interested from beginning to end. But in the meantime, I have a good recording of the first movement that I'm going to share with you today. This sonata is pretty remarkable as it's perhaps the most concentrated of all Beethoven sonatas. And by concentrated, I mean that Beethoven uses a tremendous amount of motivic economy. He basically generates all three movements of this piece from just three motives, all of which are stated at the very opening of the first movement. He also states each motive with a different tempo as though to more clearly delineate it. Uh, this sonata was probably an experiment on Beethoven's part to see how much he could do with minimal material that was very clearly stated at the opening of the sonata. It's also a development of an idea he had used before in the Pathetique Sonata first movement of having a slow introduction return during the course of a movement. Uh, in this case, the slow intro is much shorter in its first appearance, and then it is greatly expanded when it comes back in the recap. Uh, as an aside, this was probably one of several models that Chopin had in mind also when he wrote his B-flat minor sonata, but I'll talk about that more when I get to Chopin's B-flat minor sonata. Now, of course, Beethoven did not always write in this way. There are some works, like the Opus 26 sonata, which starts with a set of variations, that are very diffuse. Uh, that, that work is very special in a kind of intentional lack of motivic unity. Uh, there, Beethoven creates unity instead through mood, and ironically, through contrast as well. But here we have the maximalist approach to motivic concision. So there are three ideas. An arpeggio, a pattern of descending two note groups, which you could also hear as a descending scale of five notes, embellishment figure. So it's a turn in its first appearance. Once we actually reach the first theme proper in the sonata form, you'll hear that in the left hand we have the exact rhythm of motive one, just sped up to the fast tempo, this kind of arpeggio motive. to this, the right hand plays a sinuous melody, which is a variant on the turn idea of motive three. There's one more idea here that should be mentioned. Uh, I don't really mark it in the score, and it doesn't maybe qualify as a full motive, but it's an important element nonetheless, and that is the tremolo, this kind of wild tremolo triplet accompaniment. And this kind of accompaniment uh, or similar perpetual motion accompaniments are heard constantly throughout this movement, and they feed into this obsessive feeling of constant physical motion, which characterizes the fast tempo sections of this piece. Eventually, this feeds into the continual 16th note motion of the perpetual motion finale as well. ways that Beethoven finds to use these very simple motives is really wonderful. So as an example, after a transition that is based on motive two, we get a second theme. And this second theme is not obvious at first, but it's another variant of motive two, but it's slowed down and turned upside down or inverted. <laughs> And 
this slowed down version of motive two continues in the next section as the left hand develops the turn idea of motive three. continue on to the end of the exposition. The development is more rhetorical than intellectual. Beethoven basically does everything possible to shock us, and he deals almost entirely with the first theme in its form from the exposition. So that theme that I showed you is a combination of motive one and three. The most extraordinary part of this sonata structure actually occurs right at the moment when you might expect there to be the greatest amount of stability. That's right when we're coming back to the recapitulation in the sonata form, the moment where the themes from the exposition are repeated in the tonic key. At this point, Beethoven expands the intro that we heard before with improvisatory elements that were only kind of nascent in the exposition but now he allows them to fully flower. And he does this by allowing two long recitatives in single notes, obviously imitating the voice, both marked to be played in a single long pedal held from the chord. So here's the first one. So this is really different, right? Really fascinating. And expanding a recap like this, uh, treating it as an opportunity for further development is something Beethoven often did. You know, there's the example of the Fifth Symphony in the recapitulation of the first theme. He has this beautiful oboe solo that just suddenly flowers out of what before was just a pause. But the way Beethoven does it in this sonata is really pretty weird and fantastic. These recitative, you know, singing voice-like passages seem to exist in a different world from the rest of the sonata, as if these arpeggiated chords are kind of magical doorways into another universe that Beethoven has now decided to walk through. The only real motivic connection to any of the rest of the music in this sonata is a suggestion of the falling second from motive two, which I've marked. A lot of the otherworldly effect of this passage has to do with Beethoven's long pedal markings. Uh, Beethoven very rarely marked pedal. Whenever he did, it was generally for some kind of extraordinary effect, like in this passage, that you would never normally just think of doing on your own. It causes the melody to seem to bloom from the chord resonance, and it trails along this atmospheric haze of sound, which really removes us completely from anything concrete or real. And believe it or not, this is a very controversial point. You'll hear many famous pianists, particularly on recordings from the mid 20th century, lift the pedal early here so that they can play the melodies after the chords without any blurring or dissonance. Personally, I think this is a huge mistake. It really robs this passage of its evocative magic. I don't always agree with Arthur Schnabel on everything in his wonderful edition of the Beethoven Sonatas, but in this case, I'm 100% in agreement. He says, pedal mark by Beethoven, which must be carried out without fear. Changes of pedal would deprive these measures of their profound background their innermost essence. Thank you, Arthur Schnabel. And he does a fabulous job of it in his recording of the sonata as well. Now, there are definitely valid arguments in favor of changing the pedal here. Uh, Beethoven obviously wrote this for a very different instrument than what we generally use now. 
the pianos in Beethoven's day had much less natural resonance, so sound decayed a lot faster and made long pedals like this much easier to affect without an enormous amount of dissonance. So a lot of people feel that some degree of alteration is necessary to prevent these passages sounding really dissonant and messy on a modern instrument. And in theory, I would agree with that. I mean, of course, you need to follow your ear, and different instruments in different spaces require different pedaling. That's evident. You can never 100% notate every little subtlety with the pedal in a score. It just, it's impossible. But the interesting thing to me about this passage is that when it's played literally and sensitively, I don't even think these passages sound like much of a mess or too dissonant. In fact, it's always seemed to me that Beethoven wrote this passage in a way that it would work on any piano or in any space, whether that piano was built in 1800 or in 2000. I think the only alteration that is required on any piano, given a different space, is to maybe take a slower or faster tempo. So if you're playing on an 1800 forte piano, you might take a little bit of a faster tempo. If you're playing on a modern day Steinway Grand, you might need a little bit of a slower tempo to allow the dissonances to fade a little bit more, just to be softened a little bit. Anyway, we can note that Beethoven has written this passage to be played in the slowest possible tempo. There was nothing really slower than a Largo. So this is only going to help to get the right kind of sound. Now, if you really feel like there is too much dissonance, you can, of course, engage in some careful half pedaling here. And this has to be adjusted for each instrument based on your tempo and the resonance of the room you're in. Holding on to the left hand chord throughout the passage can really help prevent you from losing too much of the bass resonance when you do half pedal. Most of the dissonances that people find to be a little bit disturbing are in the right hand part. It's wherever there are half steps or whole steps. Another option are to hold all the notes of the chord on the sostenuto pedal, and then you can pretty much pedal normally. Uh, that's another solution. You'll pick up a lot of sympathetic vibrations from the chord that is being held on the sostenuto pedal, so you do still get this kind of ghostly, unearthly sound without all the dissonance in the right hand. But I really like the dissonance, actually. I think it really adds to the kind of anguished feeling of these passages. So I say, hold the pedal throughout, don't worry about it, adjust the tempo and dynamics so that it works. The rest of the movement basically plays out like one would expect, except that the first th theme, since it was treated extensively in the development, is truncated, and instead it's replaced with this kind of weird and creepy passage. to explain, it might possibly reference the very end of the exposition. There are these repeated chords that you hear at the end of the exposition. Which might connect to these staccato chords that we hear. And then also, of course, the arpeggio figuration could be seen as some kind of connection to the opening arpeggio of the piece. So please enjoy the complete performance. Let me know your thoughts on this piece, particularly if you have opinions on pedaling in passages like these or in others of Beethoven's extraordinary pedal markings, like the opening of the finale of the Waldstein Sonata, for example. Also, be sure to hit the like button and the subscribe button in YouTube. And if you want to financially support this channel, of course, you can do that easily at uh, patreon.com, www.patreon.com forward slash independent pianist. Another easy way to support the channel is to study with me. I do accept private students that I teach online, and you can just drop me a line at call at independentpianist.com if you're interested in that. Also, I put a new edition of Ravel's Sonatina on my website. It's uh, fairly simple. I just went through and put in all my fingerings and some other performance suggestions as well. So if you're studying that piece, you might find it to be a helpful guide to finding good fingerings for a very tricky piece. So check that out too. I have a link to that in the description box. Uh, otherwise, just stay tuned to next week. I'll have the complete performance of the Tempest Sonata coming up once I finally got that second movement down. And I have other fun repertoire in the works, including some very contemporary music. So until next time, take care.